And my hope for us today is that we would be encouraged by Jesus and what he would have for us. And as we uh, talked last week about how Jesus is greater than our sin, you know, my hope today is that we would see that, that Jesus is leading us someplace out of where we were to a future that he has in store for us. And the path to that future is really going through service. Not attending here, but being a servant. Jesus told us that if anybody wants to be great among you, you must be a servant to all. And so today we're going to talk about servants. We're going to talk about how Jesus is greater than Moses. And ultimately, our big idea today is that I must be a faithful servant. That you and I, we are all called to have the same job title in the kingdom of heaven, servant of God. And we're in an interesting time right now. Uh, I, now I might, as I say what I'm about to say, I know I might anger some people uh, because we no longer have a professional NBA team in our city. They moved, they were stolen, they were robbed from us, and they went to Oklahoma. Um, now I know, this is like, I, I know, I'm getting into it, but this is the time of year, NBA playoffs season. Yeah, yeah. you're with me, Kenny? All right, you and me, dude. Uh, so the... NBA, too many games to watch the whole season. That's just where I'm at. I have two kids, and uh, um, I just can't. But the playoffs, playoffs and March Madness, I can watch basketball. They're contained periods of time. And this is the time every year where people start having the conversation, who is the greatest of all time? The GOAT, which is a terrible way to talk about somebody. But anyway, who is the greatest of all time? time in the NBA. And so I'm going to ask you, who, who do you think? Who would people be arguing the greatest of all time? Go. Michael Jordan. Yes. Who else? I've never heard. I just heard a book. Like, I need louder. Curry. Steph Curry. Yes. Okay. Who else? Detlef Schrempf. But on his driver's license, it would be Schrempf Detlef. Sure. Uh, all right. Who else? Yes. Pete Maravich. Yes. Who's the, who's the current contender right now? I mean, Steph's pretty great. LeBron. LeBron James, is he the greatest of all time? And this is where people get into fights on the internet, over Thanksgiving, wherever you might talk. Like, LeBron is the greatest of all time, and then somebody like, no, it's Jordan. Now, here's the problem, guys. <laughs> Mathematically, LeBron is the greatest of all time, but I just like Jordan more. And that's really where we are so often in this debate. And we fight and we go round and round and round because we all have our favorites. They're the greatest of all time. And, and Matt, you jokingly said Detlef Schrempf, but this morning as I was thinking about it, I was like, someone's going to say Detlef Schrempf. And you did it. So <laughs> high five. Awesome. But all of these arguments, and it's not just NBA where we get into the, the argument about the greatest of all time, right? Because you could talk about golf and take a nap. You could talk about the NFL. You could talk about Major League Baseball. You could talk about all these different sports, and there's all these different statistics and all these things where people track and say, they are the greatest of all time, and you get so fired up, and then you realize it doesn't matter. It's just grown men playing a game. It really isn't that important. We should not fight over these things and like lose friends over who is the greatest basketball player of all time because it's just not that big a deal. But today... Today, the passage that we're going to look at in the book of Hebrews, it's, it's going to be a shocking one because today the writer is going to talk about how Jesus is greater than Moses. And I know you're like gasping, you're grasping your plural. It went way better in the 930. I'll try again. <laughs> yeah, Moses, Jesus is greater than Moses. And you're like, oh, a gas. And you're like grasping your pearls. I can't believe he said it. And I know you just, you're like, what's the big deal? Of course he is. But for the people who were reading this letter for the first time, Moses, like you couldn't hold a candle to Moses. He was the most important person in the Old Testament. He was the guy that God used to lead the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt. He was the guy through whom God gave the law to the people. He was the guy. He was the greatest of all time. But Moses himself said there would be a prophet like him that would, be, that would raise up that God would use, listen to him. Moses understood that he was not the end of the line, that there would be one greater than him. And we see now that that is 
fulfilled in Jesus. Moses was a servant of God, serving God's people. And it's good to say, you know what, I want to be more like Moses because we are called to be faithful servants. Moses is a great example. But our ultimate example is Jesus, who is our high priest. He is the greatest servant that came to the earth to show us the way to God. And if we want to follow after Jesus, then we need to learn to be servants as well, to walk with him. And so we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It's on page uh, 839 in the chair Bibles. And if you don't own a Bible, you can take that Bible home. We love giving those away. And, uh, and if you want to follow along, you can follow along in the Creekside app as well, and all the notes will be in there. You can write your own notes or just write your notes on the note sheet in the program, doodle if you need to, uh, and to keep your mind occupied. And uh, we're going to talk about how Jesus is greater than Moses. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of the people of Israel, and we're going to show how Jesus is calling us to be faithful in all of life. Sound good? All right, let's do this. Hebrews chapter 3. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. Anytime you read a passage in the Bible and you see the word therefore, I'm going to give you a little Bible study tip. When you see the word therefore, you need to ask this question. What's that therefore? Therefore. Now, it's totally cheesy, but I hope you remember, because context is important. And as we walk through this book of, he of Hebrews, the writer is building an argument to show how Jesus is greater. And so last week, after saying that Jesus is greater than, than our, our sin and that he took on flesh to become fully human, fully God, he laid his life down on the cross as a sacrifice for us. Therefore, all that he has done, look to Jesus. It's so easy to get distracted by so many other things and all kinds of different conversations that can be just that, distractions. But through it all, we need to look to Jesus. And I love how the writer talks about Jesus here. He talk, get, uses two terms that are important. One is our, he is our apostle. Now, that's not a word we throw around all the time, but it means sent one. Jesus was sent by God to rescue humanity. He was sent by God to rescue me and you from our sin, to bring us into relationship with God. Jesus was sent. After Jesus was killed on the cross, was resurrected, returned to the Father, he told his disciples that the Holy Spirit would empower them to take his good news from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. He was sending them out. The disciples were apostles. And now, today, as followers of Jesus, we are sent. We are called to be faithful uh, servants of Jesus, and the greatest service that we have is we go out as sent ones to take that good news, to take that gospel that Jesus is rescuing lost people. We are sent. Jesus is our first apostle. We're following after him. The second phrase that the, the writer uses is high priest. And the high priest is the mediator between God and humanity. The high priest in the Old Testament was the person who would offer up the sacrifices to the Lord to help mediate sin, to, to cover over the sins of the people of Israel. And we're going to talk about high priests more throughout the book of Hebrews, but Jesus is our great high priest, that he is the sacrifice he laid his life down on the cross, but he is also the sacrificer. He obeyed. He was faithful to the mission for which he was sent. 
So he is our high priest. And right now, he's mediating for us. We can approach the throne of God with confidence because Jesus is our great high priest. And sometimes I know when you pray, you might feel like, I don't know if my prayer is doing anything. I don't know if, if, if God's listening. I don't know if Jesus is listening. I don't know if the Holy Spirit's listening. I just don't know. And I, I want you to, to be encouraged today that every time you pray, Jesus is listening. He's interceding for us right now. And so when you bring your concerns, your cares, your worries to the Lord, when you bring these items that we wrote down, all these things that can pull our distraction away from Jesus, he is listening and he is interceding. He is our great high priest. And as I said, we're going to get more into the high priest later on. But he starts talking about our apostle and our high priest. And they're like, yes, Jesus is all these things. And then he says, now consider Moses. Moses, like I said, is a big deal. And the story of Moses is fascinating because he was born into slavery. I'm not going to read the whole Moses story. You can find that in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy if you want to read all about Moses. Um, but he was born into slavery in Egypt. And at the time of his birth, the Pharaoh was killing all of the baby boys born in Egypt because he was worried about the population of the Hebrews. And, and so he was killing all the Hebrew baby boys, and Moses' family was trying to protect him after he was born. And, and so they were keeping him secret, and then eventually they, they, they put him in a basket made of reeds, and they put him on the Nile River and let him go. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Egypt, and I was on a boat on the Nile River. And I was amazed to just think, like, this is, this is where Moses was let go on this very river. And they, they, they set him free into God's hands, not knowing what would happen. Anybody ever have those kinds of moments where you have to like let something go, not knowing what's going to happen? That's called faith. And God orchestrated events so that Pharaoh's daughter was there bathing in the river, and here comes this baby in a basket. And she rescued him. She named him Moses, which means drawn out, because she drew him out of the river. Now, Moses' sister was following along um, just to kind of see, where does Moses go? And she said, hey, if you need somebody to, to watch and raise that baby, I, I know somebody who could help you. Turns out it was Moses' mom. And so Moses' mom, like, raised him to, and weaned him, and then after he was weaned, he was released into Pharaoh's household, and he grew up as an Egyptian, but knowing he was a Hebrew. And one day, they, he saw the, the, the people who were being mistreated. And he saw an Egyptian slave driver beating a Hebrew. And Moses comes along and he killed the man, buried him in the sand. And when you read the story, it, it seems like maybe this is Moses' time. He's like, I will liberate my people. The next day, he sees two Hebrews fighting, and he says, stop it. And one of the men looked to him and says, what, are you going to kill us too? Moses realized he had been found out, that they knew he had killed somebody. And so he was afraid, and he ran away. He went into the wilderness to Midian, another country there, and he, he became a shepherd for 40 years, wandering with sheep, 40 years. One day as he's out tending the sheep, he sees a, a, a bush. It's a fire. And that's not uncommon. What was uncommon was that this bush was not being consumed. Now, if you saw this, you would probably check it out. And I know some of you are pyros, and so looking at you, uh, you would probably go check it out and say, like, how can I learn how to do this as well? But um, some of you, Right, you, we would all go and say, like, what's happening here? And as Moses approached, this bush started talking to him. Now, again, you would do whatever this bush said. <laughs> a bush starts talking to you, and you're like, what's going on? And it, it's the voice of God coming from this bush saying, Moses, I have called you to lead my people out. And 
So Moses goes back to the people, back to Egypt. After 40 years on the run, he goes back to say, Pharaoh, let my people go. And you've all seen the Ten Commandments, but this was real. Like, it was, this really happened. And through a series of, of, of different signs and wonders and these, these curses that came across on the, onto the Egyptians, eventually Pharaoh's heart was softened enough to let the people go. And Moses is leading them through that. He takes them out. They encounter God on Mount Sinai, and God gives them the law and the commandments, and, and Moses is, is there, and he's mediating all of, between God and the people, and, and they keep moving, and they're going towards the, the land that God had promised, and so they send, out, they send out 12 spies to scope out the land to see how can we do this, and they came back, and 10 of them said, we can't do it. There's giants. We cannot conquer this land. But two, Joshua and Caleb, and we're going to talk about Joshua a little bit later. Joshua and Caleb said, no, we can't. God is with us. But the people, they believed the 10 instead of the two. And they said, let's go back to Egypt. How many times have we faced things that are bigger than we think we can handle? And we said, it would be better to go back to the slavery we know. So they start to say, we need to go back. And then God says, if you go back, if you doubt me now, you will perish. You will die in the wilderness. And they're like, well, you know what, maybe we should try again. But because they disobeyed, disobeyed, disobeyed. They, they went and said, let's go do it. But they weren't doing it in God's plan and God's blessing and faith. They were doing it because they were scared of the other thing. And, and they were defeated. And so for 40 years, they wandered the wilderness as a generation of Hebrews died out because of their disobedience. But Moses was with them through it all. Moses was a faithful servant. Was he perfect? No. He was not perfect. But he was with the people. And so when the people talked about Moses as the greatest of all time, then it makes sense that they would be like shocked when here the writer is saying, Mo Moses is great, but Jesus deserves greater honor. And he talks about this house. And, and Moses is a servant in God's house. But who built the house? God. And the builder, the owner, deserves greater honor than the servant. And then who is Jesus? Well, Jesus is the son of the builder. He's the son of the owner. It's his house too. So he's still greater than Moses. But now who is this house? It's the people of God. It's us, you and me. We are the house of God today. And the Holy Spirit is in us. And, and, and so as we work together, as we move the mission forward together, we are still called not to just be the house, but to be like Moses, to be a servant, to find our place, to be a part of God's community, to be a part of his mission. And so Jesus is the one in all of that who we look to, to say, Jesus, we're looking to you. You deserve greater honor than us. You deserve greater honor than, than Moses. You deserve greater honor than any leader. Jesus, you are greater. And so he encourages them to look to Jesus, to keep holding on to him, to hold on to that confession that Jesus is greater. And Jesus even talks about this, this image of this house. Because he, remember, he's sent. He was sent to make a way for us to come back to the Father. And in John 14, the night before Jesus was crucified, he was telling his disciples and encouraging them that his work is not done. And he says this in John 14 too, My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus provided a way for us to be a part of God's family, 
to be welcomed in to God's house. And today, my hope for you and for all of us is that we would always look to Jesus. He is the only way. Maybe you're not yet following Jesus, but you came because a friend brought you, you followed the blue signs, or you just live around in the neighborhood, you wanted to just drop in. I am so glad that you're here. Because my hope for you today is that you would say yes to what Jesus has done for you and that he would, you would be welcomed in to God's family. Because Jesus came to, to welcome us in and he welcomes us by his death where he paid the penalty for our sin. And sin is not just behavior. It's our heart. Our hearts are prone towards selfishness, towards, towards greed, towards disobedience. But Jesus came to make a way for us to be a part of God's family, to be transformed from the heart out. Jesus made that way. Today, I want to encourage you to, to reflect on Scripture and, and memorize a passage with me. And it's uh, two passages this week, actually, so maybe you can even choose one. Uh, John 14, 6, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Hebrews uh, 3, 6, but Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house, and we are his house if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. Will you reflect on those this week and, and uh, try to memorize them with me? And if you will, let me know on your card and just mark, yes, I will do that. Because holding on to these truths can help us in the times of difficulty, the times of struggle, to remember that Jesus is greater and he is with us. Let's keep going. The, the writer is going to refer to some passages in the Old Testament here that kind of sum up the story that I just told you about the people of Israel. Uh, and so we're going to jump in in verse 7. So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in that rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have, no, they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. If you've been around Creekside for a while, you may have heard me say that today is the best day to say yes to Jesus. Today is the best day. And here, the writer of Hebrews is reminding them, as long as it is called today, in this season, in this moment, where the gospel is presented, where Jesus is lifted up, and we recognize that now is the time of salvation, now is the time to be rescued, today is the day. And if you have been thinking about following Jesus and you have been putting it off, putting it off, putting it off, what are you waiting for? Step in to that grace. Step in to that forgiveness to say, yes, I know that there is something more than me trying to do life on my own. I know there is something more than me trying to earn God's love. You can't earn it. He wants to give it to you. Will you just say, yes, yes, I need that. And if that's you today, today is the day. Today is the day. And here the, the writer is talking about the story of the people and their unbelief, and he's saying, don't be like that, but encourage one another. Encourage one another. Build each other up. The problem so often is that our, we lean into our sinful behavior because we lack faith. Disobedience reveals where our faith is weak. Disobedience reveals where our faith is weak. And so if we think about the struggles that we have, the temptations that come toward us with our pride and our greed, 
lust, all of these are, ex- when we exercise those temptations, they're expressions of where our faith is weak, where we think God is not enough or we deserve better. When we refuse to serve others, we might even be thinking, God can't use me, but you, he can and he will. When we don't practice generosity, we say, God, I don't believe you're going to continue to provide, but he can and he will. When we try to isolate ourselves and not live in community because we don't want to be known by others and we think we can do it on our own, you can't. You're not believing that God can use this community to change our hearts and our lives to encourage one another. And so as faithful servants, one of the things that we are called to do is to encourage faithfulness in others, to look to our our brothers and sisters in Christ and build each other up. I want to ask you a couple questions. Do you have a friend who can do that? Do you have somebody in your life who is encouraging you to trust Jesus more, to turn away from disobedience? And this friend is not just somebody who's nice to you. There's plenty of people who are nice to you. The friend I'm talking about is the friend who will tell you the truth the friend who will tell you you've got, you've got spinach in your teeth. The friend who will tell you that the things that you're into are a distraction from what Jesus is calling you to. The friend who will tell you like the sin in your life and say, hey, I love you too much to let you keep going down that path. Do you have that kind of friend? In some circles, you might have heard of this as a, a, an accountability partner, somebody to, to keep you accountable to one another, to keep you accountable to God, and that's a great practice. Do you have that kind of friend? And maybe one of the things that might be helpful to you, because it, sometimes that kind of friend can be scary, because they're going to get into your, your business, and you're like, I don't want that. Get over it, because you need it. But another way to think about this friend, instead of accountability, is, is an editor. Now, I'm in, in the midst of a huge writing season for my life, so pray for me. Um, but one of the things that I've asked people to do, I've invited people into my life, to serve as editors of my project. And they're going to tell me things I don't want to hear. Because I write, I I believe every word that I write is just wonderful. And they're going to look at me and say, I have no idea what you're talking about. This is confusing. This is distraction. Distracting. Build this up. Take this out. That's what editors do. Why? Because they want you to succeed. Editors don't want you to fail. They want you to succeed. Do you have editors in your life? People who say, hey, that's distracting you from what you need to do. Those words you just said, not helpful. Do you have editors? That's one of the ways that we encourage one another as long as it is called today and faithful servants encourage faithfulness in others. Another way we do that is in groups. That's why we talk about groups every quarter. We try to fill groups because this is where you can get to know some people who may could end up being those editors, those people who will speak into your life. And this is a great time to join groups. So grab a groups catalog, sign up for groups in the, in the app. There's a link in there. You can do that. Write down, I want to join a group on your Discover card. Do that. And we will find a way to connect you with the group because you do not need to do life alone. Encourage one another as long as it is called today. Another way that we can do that is in ministry teams. And there are people who are volunteering to, to, to make these gatherings happen. There are people volunteering throughout the week to to help move the mission forward. There are people volunteering right now at Bitter Lake in North Seattle, preparing to serve food to people who either can't come to church or feel uncomfortable in a traditional Sunday gathering like this. And we want to love them and take the gospel to them. And so they're preparing to serve there now. Join the ministry team. Encourage others as long as it is called today. And this is a great time to join a ministry team. And so if, you're, if, you're, if you call Creekside your home church and you're like, I'm not really on a ministry team, join one. Mark on your Discover card, like right now, go, I need to join a ministry team. And mark that, and we'll find a place for you to serve. Because when we use our gifts, when we serve others, we are like Jesus. We are like Moses, because we are encouraging others, as long as it is called today. And I want to encourage us to be faithful servants, To not just think that everything is about me and what I need, but to say, Lord, what can I do to bless somebody else? 
What can I do to give myself away? So I want to ask you a couple questions as we're thinking about encouraging others as long as it is called today. The first question is, who are you encouraged by? Maybe it is that accountability. Maybe it is that editor in your life. Or maybe it's somebody, somebody else that is just an encouraging presence. And I, I want to ask you on your Discover card to, to write down their names. To say, like, I am encouraged by these people. Because I want you to be thinking about what they're doing that's encouraging you because I think they can help you understand how you can encourage somebody else. Encourage others as long as it is called today. So who's encouraging you? Who's speaking into your life? But don't let it just stop with you. Because that's the next one. I will encourage. Who is somebody that you know needs to be encouraged by Jesus today? Who's somebody that you know that is going through a hard time, going through difficulty, And you're just like, I just want to love them and encourage them. And maybe it's just listening to what they're going through. That can be one of the most encouraging things you can do for somebody. Will you step out and serve and encourage faithfulness in somebody else? Encourage somebody. And maybe through your encouragement, they might not even be following Jesus, but because you care, because you care, they might want to know why do you care? Why do you care? Because Jesus cares for you. Jesus cares for them. And Jesus is the way into the family of God. And if we are called to be faithful servants, that's our, our whole thing. So we want to help people discover, trust, and love Jesus, to bring them in to God's family, to say this is, this is what you were meant for, to be a part of the family of God. So today, will you be and encouragement. Will you share what Jesus has done in your life to help others that that Jesus might shape them and change them? And we believe that the best way to do this is in relationship. The model of our church is a a table because the table is a, a great tool for relationship building. And when we sit down together and and share a conversation over that tabletop, we are helping people discover, trust, and love Jesus. We can be discipling one another. We can be reaching out to somebody who's not yet following Jesus. Whatever it is, that table is a universal tool for the mission. That's why groups are so great, because I love my my groups. I I have a group that I lead most quarters, meets at McDonald's. And I love going to McDonald's on Saturday mornings, because I know that's my church that day. And at that church, like Ray Kroc built this church, put all these tables in there, and we get to sit and we get to talk about Jesus together. It's pretty awesome. Will you invite people into your life? Invite people to a group that you're in? Maybe you need to join a group. Invite yourself into some other people's lives. Be a part of what Jesus is doing and encourage one another as long as it is called today. And if you you are looking for that encouragement, you're looking for that hope, you're longing for something more, then I want to invite you, if you're not yet following Jesus, to say yes to him today. And there's a place on your Discover card where you can mark become a follower of Jesus Christ. And today is the best day. It is the best day to say yes to Jesus. And it is the best decision you are ever going to make. So will you let us know on your Discover card if that's you today, if you're saying yes to Jesus, because we want to give you some next steps. We want to encourage you. We want to ask, answer questions you might have, give you tools continue to grow and follow after Jesus. But we also want to invite you in to the family of God so we can walk with you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your kindness towards us. Thank you that you are still drawing people to Jesus. So Lord, where there are areas of disobedience in our life, we pray that you would soften our hearts so that we would respond to, to that that to those changes that you want to make, that you would help us to turn from our sin and we would follow after you, that you would help us to turn from where our faith is weak and we would look to you and our faith would be strengthened. And Lord, we pray for those who, are, who, who know that they need Jesus, they know they need hope here today, and Lord, that they're saying, yes, I need hope. I need forgiveness of my sin. I need a new direction. 
And so, Lord, we're praying that your Spirit would draw them to Jesus today, and that you would help them take those next steps of faith. And Lord, help us to walk together well as we follow after Jesus. We love you, Lord. Help us serve you well. Help us encourage others well. Help us worship you well. Amen.